All right. We are so happy to welcome Pastor Mark back from his sabbatical. Yes, give him a nice, nice round of applause. Uh, so it's just going to be such a blessing to have him back. And I know God has prepared a message, uh, especially for us today through him. So let's pray over him. Heavenly Father, we uh, are thankful for sabbaticals and respites and time that uh, we can rest in there. And we, we pray that you've done exactly that in Mark and the Ramirez family. Uh, so just use Pastor Mark today to, to share your, your words and your message. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> I am so glad to be back here with all of you. For those of you who don't know, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here at Palo Alto First Christian Church, and I have been on sabbatical for the last eight weeks. For some of you, that felt like one week, and for others of you, it felt like eight years. Uh, but I am excited. People have been asking me, how are you doing? How was your trip? And my response is fantastic. Um, I did, like... You know when you take time off that like there is going to be refreshing, but it was very refreshing for me to be able to be somewhere and not have the burden of leadership. So as Alpha already shouted out, a big shout out to Heather and the entire team and everyone who, who made it possible for me to not have to worry. It was a huge blessing of, I was telling Anne this morning, I don't think I've set my alarm to wake up for like eight weeks and I just let my body natural rhythm. And so this morning I had to set my my alarm for 6.30, and I was ripped out of sleep for the first time in eight weeks, but I'm raring and ready to go, so let's dive into God's Word this morning. Today is week 14. We are closing out our Living the Impossible series. For the past three-plus months, we have been looking through the beginning of the early church in the book of Acts and asking ourselves, if they could live the impossible, can we too? Are there things in our lives that we can look to the truth of Scripture and believe that there are impossible things for us to do today? And do you know what I've found a lot of people feel is impossible? Well, one of the biggest things that people feel impossible is to be comfortable with your own journey, to be comfortable with the timeline of how long should I be at this place, when should I go? When should I stay? Where do I belong? These are questions that people are always asking. We like to know what's coming down the road. If all of us could have a crystal ball of the future, I'm pretty sure most people would say yes to that. Yes, I would like to be able to see some things. We live in a very transient place here in the Bay Area. People are constantly moving in, Moving out, moving jobs, moving homes, moving churches. We are constantly in motion. Some of you have chosen, this is where I'm going to be. Others of us say, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. But whether we get to choose or whether we are leaning on God, we, st we still feel it in this place. We feel the constant motion and movement. And so a question I have for all of us this morning, how do you know when to go? And also, how do you know when to stay? Some of you have lived here for literal decades. Some moved from out of town. Other people have been here their entire lives. How do you know when to go? And how do you know when to stay? If you're not a follower of Jesus, it can be easy for us to make decisions and just say, well, it doesn't matter. Whatever I want, whatever is going to make me happy is, is what defines whether I stay or whether I go. But if we say yes to Jesus, we believe that he is a part of the conversation. We believe that he has a plan. And so we need to invite him into the conversation and ask, where is it that God wants me? Yeah. And so the title of our message this morning is, should I stay or should I go? And if anybody is worried about this based on me coming back from my sabbatical, don't worry, I wrote this message before I left. So me being, on, on, being gone on sabbatical has no influence on this sermon this morning. So last week, 
We've been reading all, not just last week, but the whole series has been going through the book of Acts, and we've been seeing constant motion. We've been seeing the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, and so many people staying and going, and a lot more going than staying. Constant motion. We're going to the next town, to the next town, and the next town. And last week, Frank did a fantastic job sharing out of chapter 17 and expressing Paul's story in the city of Athens. And Frank did such a good job showing how, how Paul knew his audience, how as he arrived in this town, he had never been there before, but as he arrived, he took time to understand the people that lived there so that he would be able to present the gospel clearly to them. Paul was willing to step out of his comfort zone in order to share the truth. And so we're going to take some of that with us as we continue in Paul's journey. We're going to be in Acts chapter 18 this morning, starting in verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who believed Paul who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. The first point I want to make for us this morning, it's not really points, we're more asking questions. First question we have, is there confirmation? When I ask the question, should I stay or should I go, is there confirmation one way or the other? We see here that Paul arrives in Corinth and he receives a vision from the Lord that says, hey, you don't have to worry or be afraid. I want you to stay here. There is confirmation from the Lord that I want you to be here. And I don't know about you all, but I wish that any time I tried to make a big decision in my life, that the Lord would just meet me in a vision and let me know exactly what I need to do. Do I need to take this job? Yes. <laughs> do I need to move? No. I wish that we could just have this dialogue with God with clear, succinct language. And we've seen it a few times in the book of Acts. A few weeks ago, we saw the story where P Paul wanted to go in one direction, and we are told that the spirit of Jesus prevented them from going. He got a, he got a very exact no. And here we get a very exact yes. And so when we are considering the question, where do I belong? Should I stay or should I go? I have to ask myself, is there confirmation one way or the other? Do I see God doing something in my current state of affairs? And do I see the potential for God to do something in this new opportunity? So we start this section of chapter 18 with Paul leaving Athens. And he travels over to Corinth, which Corinth was the, essentially the, the capital of that region known as Centria. And as Paul travels there, Corinth is a major port town. You can see it there. It's in between these two points. And because of that, it was a major city for people to travel with, both for business and for pleasure. And there were a lot of people present in that city. And we know that that city had a lot of issues because when Paul later writes a letter to the Corinthians, he's bringing up a lot of issues that they have. And so Paul arrives in Corinth. And we are told that he meets some people there, Aquila and Priscilla, who had recently lived in Rome, 
but had been removed from Rome because the emperor at the time had issued a decree that all of the Jews must leave. And we know that this took place sometime between 41 AD and 54 BC, because in 41 AD, not BC, the other one was AD, uh, in 41, someone said there's never been any expulsion of people from Rome. So we know it couldn't have been before then. And it had to have been, obviously, before this point in time when Paul arrives here in Corinth. And there's all kinds of theories on why the Jews had to leave. But I don't think that's important for us this morning. What is important? They were forced to go. What was the confirmation in their life? Legal ruling saying, you can't be here anymore. And these people moved out, and they they didn't just go out of Rome to the local suburbs uh, five miles down from Rome. They get out of town. They get out of all of Italy, and they head all the way over to Greece. They most likely have a business, as we are told that they are tent makers. And here we we peek in a little bit to a, a part of Paul's life that we don't always consider. Paul was a tent maker. The, the literal Greek more expresses a, a leather worker, but most times when people were working with leather, they were making tents. And so Paul, he, he, didn't, he wasn't a rich man. He wasn't just walking around throwing cash everywhere that he went. He had no one to support him. So everywhere, all of these stories that we've been reading, if Paul went here and here and here, if Paul needed money, he had to work for it. And here, at this point in our story, Paul is alone. He does not have any traveling companions with him. So he arrives in Corinth and is probably low on funds. So what does he do? He meets some people, and it just so happens that they are in the same line of work as him, and they also believe in Jesus. And so he joins them, and he starts working, and he would work six days of the week, and then every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, speaking to both the Jews that were there and then God-fearing Greeks, Gentile people that were present. So Paul's entire life is one of sacrifice and dedication to the Lord. I am very blessed to be in a church that I don't have to go and work nine to five somewhere else and then show up here on Sunday after a long work week doing construction or all kinds of other stuff. I can focus all of my effort and attention on taking care of the needs of the gospel and telling people about Jesus. So thank you, church, for making it possible for the gospel to be preached and that I don't have to go and make tents. Praise the Lord. And so we are told that Silas and Timothy, they had left him up in Thessalonica. Paul had gone by himself down to Athens and then now to Corinth. And here we see them meet up. And when they arrive, suddenly Paul is able to devote himself exclusively. Most likely, the church at Thessalonica sent some money with them. Later on in Scripture, we see that Paul expresses thanks to churches for how they sent money to him to be able to spread the gospel more and more. So Silas and Timothy come, and suddenly Paul is able to dedicate himself exclusively. My focus and my attention is on spreading the gospel with other people. And I think it's important for us to notice that because sometimes confirmation doesn't come from the voice of God. Paul sees confirmation of maybe there's something more for me to do here in Corinth, Because now I have the freedom and the opportunity to share the gospel more. Suddenly, I'm free. Suddenly, I don't have to work. And maybe this is God pointing that there is more for me to do here. He didn't get a vision at that point saying, hey, this money is from me. Go and do likewise. No, he received this money and realized this is an opportunity. And so while he's in the synagogue, he shares the gospel, and a few people believe, but for the most part, the Jews, as we have seen through a lot of Acts, do not like the gospel. They oppose Paul, and oppose him to the point of, quote, becoming abusive, meaning we're getting a little physical, we're getting a little violent, and we're getting a little, we don't want Paul around this city anymore. And so he shakes out his clothes, and shaking out of clothes was usually reserved for Jews towards Gentiles. You are the other people. You are the unbelievers. And so I shake off my clothes in a sign of your blood is on your own head. I'm not responsible for you. And so for 
for Paul to do this towards his own people, towards Jews, is a big deal. For him to shake off his clothes and be like, I treat you as unbelievers. I treat you as not one of us is a big deal. And then I always have to laugh in this story. He leaves the synagogue, and what are we told? He goes next door. It's like you, you work for one company, and you leave that company, and you start the exact same type of company right next door. And they're like, wait a minute. This isn't, you know all of our secrets. You know all the tricks of the trade. You can't do this. And so Paul goes right next door, makes it convenient if you want to hear Paul. You go to church, and then you go to Paul's right after church. And so Paul is right next door to the synagogue, and what are we told? One of the leaders of the synagogue believes in the gospel believes in Jesus Christ. This is a major deal. It, it's, it's not like, oh, like one person left the synagogue, the leader of the synagogue. Imagine what church would be like if you showed up one day and it was like, oh, Pastor Mark went and joined a cult. He's not here anymore. That's what it would be like for these people. The head of our synagogue just left with Paul and the crazy stuff he's talking about. And by the way, they're next door which is also weird. And so we see God's blessing and hand over this. Up until this point, there's been a lot of issues with Jewish people. But here's major breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Paul is willing, every single city he goes to, he goes to the synagogue first because he believes that the Jewish people, with all of the promises of God and the prophets, that they need to hear the gospel first. And we see time and time again, even with the negativity, there is always hope. There is always the people that are willing to say yes. And then he has this vision. And what does God tell him? First of all, do not be afraid. I'm always thankful for passages like this because I think of Paul walking in there with confidence. He's already evangelized city after city after city, and yet God has to remind him, do not be afraid. Why? Because he probably is. Because everywhere that Paul goes, I don't think he's this machismo, bravado guy going, I'm with the gospel and I'm here to save you. No. He doesn't know how people are going to react. He doesn't know where his next meal is going to come from sometimes. Later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he reminds them. He says, so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you, what? In weakness and with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Paul reminds the Corinthians, remember when I showed up in the synagogue for the first time, and then we moved next door? It wasn't this full of confidence thing. I was terrified. I came to you with fear and trembling. And as Paul shows up in that way, it reminds me that I don't have to every, have everything together either. That there are times in my life when I am doing the right thing, when I am seeing the confirmation of God, whether through the acts of other people or his direct word, and yet I'm still afraid. And God reminds us today not to be afraid. Whether we're concerned about the future, whether we should stay or whether we should go, do not be afraid. What does God tell Paul? Do not be afraid. Why? Because I'm going to take care of you. He says, you will not be attacked. You will not be harmed. And I have many people in this city. Now, remember, Paul just got there. So what does God mean when he says, I have many people in this city? I don't think it's saying, like, you got a bunch of bodyguards that are going to back you up. I think he's saying, I have a lot of work for you to do, Paul. There are many people in the city that I know are going to say yes to me. And it's going to take you, Paul, opening your mouth and doing something. And then we are told something that we have not seen yet in the book of Acts. Paul stays for a year and a half. 
This is the longest time up until this point that we have seen Paul put down roots. Everywhere else we get the anticipation that he gets there and he's there for a week or a month or something, and then he moves on to the next place. But what are we told here? Paul, after receiving a vision from the Lord, being told it's going to be okay, Paul knows I have confirmation from God. I need to stay here. And so for a year and a half, he stays there continuing to spread the gospel, grow the church, tell people about Jesus. And we don't have all the ins and outs of everything that happened in that year and a half, but we'll continue to read and see what else is going to go on. Continuing in verse 12, when Gallio was pro council of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourself. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatever. The second question we need to ask ourselves, are you or am I willing to experience hardship? This is probably the hardest question for us to ask when we consider, should I stay or should I go? Because if there's hardship either in the staying or in the going, usually that very greatly affects our decision making because we don't like hardship. We don't like to go through stuff that makes us uncomfortable. And what was God's promise to Paul? You will not be attacked. You will not be harmed. But he didn't say you're never going to have any problems. And as has been a pattern, the Jews don't like Paul, and it continues to escalate. We don't escalate to the point of physical violence like we saw previously in Acts, where Paul was beaten, stoned. But here, they take the legal route. We can't attack Paul on religious grounds, because every time we argue with him, he's usually winning. What we read over in 1 Corinthians said that he showed and demonstrated God's power. It's hard to argue with someone who's doing miracles when they say that they are from God. And so if we can't attack him on religious grounds, we'll take him to court. And so they drag Paul in front of Gallio, who is the proconsul, the person in charge of that entire region at the time. And we can actually pinpoint that this he was in Corinth between the years of 51 and 52 AD, which is one of the biggest time stamps that we have for the book of Acts that we know that Paul was in here between these years. Because we have an inscription of someone writing a letter to Gallio saying, hey, proconsul in Achaia, how's it going, essentially? And so we have physical, archaeological evidence. This dude really lived. This dude was present in Corinth at this time. And so the Jews haul Paul in front of him, And Paul is about to open his mouth and speak. The words are on the edge of his tongue. And Gallio shuts him down and starts speaking. And it's like, look, you guys, I don't care about your little problems. The stuff that you are bringing to me, you say that he is trying to teach people to live and go against laws and worship God in a way that is not okay but most likely they weren't bringing up Jesus. Most likely they weren't trying to, to make it a Jewish problem. They were probably trying to be like, this is a new religion and it's not sanctioned by the Roman government. So what they're teaching is technically illegal. But in the eyes of the Roman Empire, it just sounds like more Judaism to them. And so they're trying to make this argument and Gallio wants absolutely nothing to do with it. He tells them, this has to do with your laws with names that you're throwing out that I don't understand, and all of your words and your Jewish stuff. So deal, about, deal it with it amongst yourselves. And this is a huge precedent because as a governor, we're not talking about just Paul spreading the gospel in this city. 
We're t- if, if Gallio said, Paul, you can't share the gospel, it wouldn't just be in Corinth. It would be in t- inside the entire region. And as the proconsul, other regions would look to his ruling and say, well, he ruled this way, so we should probably do the same. It's the same way that in our courts today, if someone makes a ruling, other people will reference that and say, well, this judge decided that in this time, so that affects your case over here. So this isn't just like, oh, Paul gets out of a big legal incident. This is a major deal for the gospel. God makes a way so that Gallio could have said, you know what, yeah, Christianity, that's no good. Let's outlaw it right now, and it would have been a huge problem, not just in this city. But what do we see? I'm not even going to hear your case. I will not be a judge. And by refusing to do it, he is essentially sanctioning Christianity and saying it's okay. Keep squabble amongst yourselves. Everything's fine. And from this point onward, we do not see Paul having an issue from a legal standpoint. There is not an attack from a legal standpoint, probably because people here, Gallio didn't want to deal with it, so we're not going to deal with it either. So the hardship that Paul faces of potential huge legal issues and potentially not being able to spread the gospel, that sounds like a hardship to me. That sounds like a reason maybe we should leave Corinth. The Jews are getting a little upset. This might go a bad way. We should leave. But no, Paul is ready and willing. He shows up to court. He shows up and is willing to open up his mouth. But God replies and says, you don't have to say anything. And then we are told, as he says, now you guys need to get out of here. Most likely they would have guards and stuff. And so the guards come and issue everyone out. And then most likely there was some racial tension going on in Corinth at the time between the Jews and the non-Jews. And so we just saw a huge blow to the Jews saying, we don't like this Paul guy. And Gallio says, I don't care. And so what does the crowd, most likely the non-Jewish crowd, do? These Jews are just stirring up issues again. We need to go and beat someone up. And they beat up the now current leader of the synagogue. And what are we told? Gallio didn't care. He showed no concern. Another way of phrasing it is he pretended not to notice. Oh, someone's getting beat up? I don't care. And so what do we see here in this instance of experiencing hardship? Paul has the potential to go through some stuff. And what does God do? He completely flips it on its head. Not only are you now legally protected, but even the people that are coming against you know they are the ones who are utterly defeated in this instance. We continue on into verse 18. We are told that after this event, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and the sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centria because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila, and he himself went into the synagogue and he reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail for Ephesus. Then he set sail from Ephesus. And when he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. The last question we need to ask ourselves is have you made a decision? And when I say that, I don't mean just a decision in your heart, but a decision based on God, based on what you believe God's will to be in the question that you are asking should I stay or should I go? Have you made a God thought decision? Because sometimes it's easy for us to not make decisions. We are paralyzed. When we have the question, do I stay or should I go? We kick that can down the road. Because we're waiting for the vision that Paul got. We're waiting for the heavens to open up and for God to say, this is my will. Stay or go. And we don't actually make a decision for ourselves. And what do I see in the book of Acts? I see Paul making a lot of decisions. They don't always work out well. But we do see God blessing Paul wherever he goes. 
And so I think it's important to ask ourselves, have I made a decision about this question that I'm asking? Here's what I think should be, but I'm also leaving it open to what God wants. And so based on these questions that we've been asking, I'm, I'm going to make a, a well-thought decision. So at, Paul, we are told that Paul is there for a year and a half. We don't know where the court case happened in that year and a half, but there was some length amount of time afterwards. And I'm sure that Paul felt the confirmation even greater after that victory before Gallio. That yes, we are going to stay here a long time. I am going to put roots down here and grow the church and tell other people about Jesus. But at some point, he makes a decision. He comes to the conclusion, now it's time for me to leave Corinth. We aren't told why. We are just told he leaves. He leaves the brothers and wants to go back to Syria, to Antioch, where everything started. And so a, a Priscilla and Aquila go with him on this journey. And we see that he cuts off some of his hair because of some vow that he made. And we're not sure what that vow is. Uh, some people think that it might be a Nazarite vow that we see in the Old Testament. But usually when you did a vow like that, you would cut your hair in the temple in Jerusalem. And so we have no idea what Paul was cutting his hair for. Maybe it was like a, he has the vision, makes a promise to God, I will stay here as long as you want me and I'll grow my hair out as long as you protect me. We don't know. But Paul makes this dedication and the vow is over and he cuts his hair off. And they continue on and land over in Ephesus, across the Aegean Sea. And as they get there, he speaks to the Jews as is his custom, and it's unlike other places that he's been. What are we told? The Jewish synagogue says, we want you here more. We want to hear. Earlier we talked about, is there confirmation? We have people saying, Paul, don't go. Paul, stay here. You just spent a year and a half in Corinth. Why not stay here for a long time? And what does Paul say? He says, no. Sometimes it's hard for us to stay or go when we see stuff happening. A door is opening, and yet the answer is still no. Paul tells them, doesn't just tell, he promises. It's very important that that phrase is in there. Paul promises, I will come back. If it's God's will. He doesn't say, I will come back, period. I want to come back. It is my plan to come back. But if I don't, don't think that I don't like you or that I change my mind. It has to be the will of God. Paul has made a decision. I will return. And yet, he knows that he is not the one who makes the decision in the end. We as Christians need to be willing to make decisions. I will stay if it's God's will. I will go if it's God's will. I need to be willing to know that I have the freedom, that Jesus Christ has given us the freedom to make decisions, knowing that ultimately he is the one who gets the say. And then he leaves. He goes back to Jerusalem, spends some time with the church there, and goes back to Antioch, where they started from. And so over these last few weeks, this, this in all total is the second missionary journey that Paul has done. He has been gone for, we know definitely at least a year and a half, but most likely he's been gone for multiple years at a time and returns back to the church in Antioch to tell them all the things that he has seen God show up and do. So what about you and me today? As we look at this story, as we ask ourselves these three questions, is there confirmation? Am I willing to experience hardship? Have I made a decision? I think there's some hope that we can find in Romans chapter 12 in the first two verses. Paul, as he writes to the church in Rome, he encourages them. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
So often we ask the question, what is God's will? What is God's will for my life, for my future? What am I, what does God want me to do? And I think when we are living lives as living sacrifices, when our lives are focused on pleasing God, being a holy and pleasing offering to him, there are some times that it doesn't matter where we're at. And that's kind of weird to say when there's so many times in Scripture when we see people needed to be places at a certain time for a certain purpose, God's got it all in his hand. And so often in our lives, we think we have so much control that that I might mess up God's plan. And so much of what I see in Scripture is you can know the will of God and he'll help you figure it out along the way. But don't just sit there and wait for the voice to come from heaven. That we need to be willing to step out in faith. Like Paul in Corinth There are times that I have fear and trembling. But when I seek to live a life of sacrifice, I start to understand where God wants me to be. I understand that as I live for him, there are times that the location does not matter. What matters is your heart. Am I going to love Jesus the same here in Palo Alto or insert city name here? Can I love Jesus the same in those two areas? Am I seeing God wants me to do something with the giftings and abilities that I have in my church, in my job, in my city? Or do I see him opening up opportunities in a new location? Do I see ways to love Jesus with family that is here where I live? Or with family elsewhere? Do I see God calling me, urging me, It's hard to know sometimes. But I think with these questions that we've discovered, we start to peel back the layers. As we look at the examples of people in the book of Acts and the entire Bible, we start to understand more and more, this is what God has for me in these days. I can confidently tell you that my family has been a part of this church for over eight years because this is where God has put us. Not by chance, not by any decision that I certainly made, but because this is where he wanted us. And being gone for the last eight weeks just confirmed, this is a family that I love and miss dearly. This is a family that I know I am here for in this time, in this season. And as you all know, I don't know how long that season is. But we trust God with each step that we take. We trust God with everything that he gives us. And we know that each and every single person in this room and watching online and watching later, we won't all be here forever. So let's make the most of the time that we have together today. So what is my next step? Based on everything that we've talked about this morning, what am I supposed to do? For some of us, we need to sit down and we need to ask ourselves... Where am I at? Is, is, is this right where I am in this season of life? Not physical location, but just everything in my life. Where am I? Others of us, you've been thinking about that a lot. And some of you need to ask the question, where am I going? It can be easy for us, even if we're not physically going somewhere, where is my life direction? It can be easy for us in the Bay Area to go on status quo week in, week out, work day to weekend, et cetera, and we don't ask ourselves the question, where am I going? Have I grown in Jesus in the last year? Am I seeking to be a better person than what I was yesterday? Where am I going? And ultimately, every single one of us need to ask, what am I doing today to live out God's will? What am I, it doesn't matter the location, it doesn't matter the job, the city, what am I doing right here, right now, today to live out God's will in my life? I'd like to invite the worship team to come to the front, and I believe Pastor Heather, she's going to pray over communion, but if you'll join me in praying. Jesus, I thank you, God, for the example that you yourself gave for us. 
that you didn't ask the question, should I stay or should I go? Because you had confidence to leave heaven knowing that it was the only way. You had confidence to go to the cross, knowing that through it we might be redeemed. And you had the confidence to go and leave your disciples, even though they would have preferred you to stay. Because you knew that it would be better that we, the church, might be you on this earth. That empowered by the Holy Spirit, we would spread your gospel and speak life and bring freedom from the darkness that oppresses us every day. And so, Jesus, we thank you for the freedom that you have given us. The freedom that we actually have the opportunity to choose. Because before we were slaves to sin and we were not in control but you have set us free so that we might live for you whether we stay or where we go. We thank you for that truth. It's in your name we pray. Amen.